I go back into my childhood. Uh, it's a very sentimental poem, but uh, I just have to write it. It's called Becoming Daddy. Um, I went to a drawer and all these black and white photographs of me and my dad at different stages of growing up fell onto the floor be before me. And I was looking at uh, the thing on Pompeii and they were showing all these skulls and tie bones and saying, oh, the members of this family were they of blood. So, Becoming Daddy. Here I am, big as big can be, taller than my daddy's knee. Now I'm father grown, stretching past, yep, my father's hip, his hand holding my hand. Then just as soon we stand shoulder to shoulder, level at last, maybe an inch or two taller, I still feel smaller. I hold his hand in my hand, the black and white world seeping into colour. Now I stand all alone. Become the man my father was. Da, dad, da, daddy, dad, daddy. Thank you. <laughs> that was my father that gave me the love of poetry that I have. But it was my uncle Michael who taught me how to write it because he could make up the most craziest things. Called. So my uncle Michael was the treasure trove of my child. This is called Uncle Michael, alias God. His hands, tobacco stained, twisted and gnarled, knotted like an alive piece of wood, scrawled gestures across my mind as the sick calf buffed in his arms and his quite strength calmed. Shh, shh, suck, suck, he groaned, and the sound sued us. And the veins, like vines, ran up and down his arms, pumping crude life like a sudden sketch to suggest the gist of rather than the meaning of things. And he walked, and I ran, towards Granny's garden, like God tended Eden, and the gate a little horse sighed at his hand, and the leaves murmured like worshippers in a church congregation, and the sunlight genuflected through the trees, and the trees wore socks and apples, a tablecloth was laid on a loganberry bush, and the young tree gave herself to him, broke tenderly in his hand, and the knife whistled and whittled, and out of the branch came a man. And he told me, and I believed him, because he was good as God and strong, that the little wooden man, the silent statue, had been waiting all the time ready-made, waiting to be released from his prison of wood. All things, he whispered, all things are waiting for you to call them, call them to come out, awake them, create them. The rhododendrons were blue with amazement that this revelation, a dragonfly walked upon the water. A butterfly became infatuated with a flower. Me? I watched his, as his hands talked, explaining things that could not be said. And he took my hand in his, and I understood. It flowed like a little stream into his big river. Felt God close, near at hand, and smiling. <laughs> my Fern Hill was a place called Ballet down in, in Cork. And that's where we used to go, and it was summer holiday land. And, uh, I had a maiden aunt who never got off the shelf. She put herself on the shelf, uh, refused all suitors, and then found herself trapped up on the shelf. And she used to compete with us kids all the time. So this is called Sad Valentine's for Breakfast. Oh my, how red cock strokes. Thinks he's a sultan, striding in and out among his harem scarum hens, talking to themselves like some low senile sentimental souls. Foolish fowl. They lay eggs for gentlemen and kids on long hot summer holidays. They hide their head, their eggs like broken hearts, like old love letter secrets, safe in unseen places. But see, Auntie Nelly, willy nilly as a fox, stalk the chickens and expose them, cruel as the news of the world. See her raid the haystacks, back seats of the old car, rain rusty machinery, her apron pregnant and precious with the warm and brown gift of eggs. Red cock grows loud against the morning marigolds, while children's voices babble sleepily into wide wakefulness. Love letter secrets staining their lips. Sad Valentines for breakfast. Breakfast. Did he say breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> he used to go down to Mayo Brown, and Mayo Brown would give you tea and buns and sixpence and all that. And Auntie Nelly didn't want us going down there. And she said, Where have you been by? And we'd go, Nowhere. And underneath her breath, we'd always sing Nelly the Elephant to her. We'd say, what did you say, Martin? Nothing. <laughs> so this is called Goodbye to the Circus, and it's Nelly's story. 
Oh, Nellie the elephant packed her trunks and said goodbye to the circus. Off she went with a trumpety trump, trump, thump, clump. The head of the herd was calling far, far away. Auntie Nellie died of drink, loneliness, and whatever. Not necessarily in that order. And the farm that was our young days, summer holidays, cast her youth like so much pig slop to the squelching grunt of cow dung days, moo cow lowing years, until the dust collected and settled in the corners no one could reach. Time left her like a holy picture high above the mantelpiece. See the children take the coloured cards in their hands, go play fish in the pool, scream snap, laugh at who is left to be old maid. Not me, not me, I was always old maid. Time never took her hand like a lover's touch. Time only waited for her. In her loneliness, she read and reread and lived on Aldous Huxley's island. She said, this said everything. Years later, when she reads like a fictional character in someone's story, when time no more mattered, I traveled to her island and touched her loneliness, felt her longing. Auntie Nellie died of drink, loneliness, and whatever. Not necessarily in that order. Said goodbye to the circus, calling far, far away. Thank you. <laughs> this is called, and I wave back. Outside the hatch, he turns slowly and talks, but I can't make out the words he says. They fall from his lips, dangle and float in space. Outside the backyard fence, a hill grabs the moon and then slowly lets it go again. The moon floating just out of reach, laughs, go on, do that again. The hill smiles, just you wait, just you wait. The moon beams as a little bird, gingerly, as if at first unsure, steps out into space and then finds flight take hold of it, as if it had only discovered it that minute and absconds with it. The darkness barks and falls into silence. And then another part of the darkness barks back. Held in gentleness, a leaf tiptoes down the breeze as if descending a spiral staircase. Time holds its breath. Outside the hatch, flat on his back, the earth, the little blue ball he has let go of, the astronaut slowly turns and waves, and I wave back. <laughs> Thank you.